there is this mindset that basically says, I can lie to you, but don't you lie to me. You know that little thing in the back of your brain that tells you not to say something before you say it? I said, yeah. She said, I don't have that little thing. And so there comes a moment when we make a decision about this is who I am going to be. And so the challenge again, it's not so much finding the right person as it is being the right person. If you found the perfect person, why would a perfect person be interested in you? She ends up feeling unloved, he feels disrespected, and each reacts in, in a negative way that feels even more unloving and disrespectful, and thus this thing spins. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, and it gets crazy. What's crack a lackin' everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapali here. Hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to tonight's first ever Faith Made Millionaire. Woo woo! Zoom. So uh, before we get started, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You have made Faith Made Millionaire a number one bestseller on Amazon in multicultural <laughs> and mixed ethics or, or missed, uh, a mixed race, whatever, multicultural category. We're number one in Christian finance and personal development. And we're number two in Christian stewardship right behind Dave Ramsey. So I appreciate you guys for do, helping us make Faith Made Millionaire a bestseller. So joining me tonight is... Somebody we brought into our conference back in San Antonio a couple years ago, Dr. Emerson Egrich, who wrote the book Love and Respect and the new Before You Hit Send. Because how many of y'all know that uh, sometimes these days we get into text battles, email battles, those type of things. And uh, he's going to share it a little bit. He just shared, he just before we got on the camera, he just shared with me that he was at Liberty University speaking to 9,000 students about his book here. So um, before we open it up to Q&A, because I want to make sure you're involved in this too as well, you have questions about your relationships, you got a question about faith and money, Dr. Emerson Egrich is also a faith-based man, so you'll be getting uh, both sides, you got finance, faith, relationships, all tonight. So with that being said, uh, Dr. Emerson Egrich, welcome to tonight's Zoom. Oh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate this, Matt, and been looking forward to it. We had a great time with you a couple of years ago, and, and uh, honored by the invitation. 100%. So I, I wanted to cir uh, circle back with you because I know love and respect um, was a conversation we had with you on our stage a couple years ago. And we started segmenting that interview on TikTok. So uh, Emerson, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you're like a trending topic right now on TikTok, over 2.1 million <laughs> views about your talk about the crazy cycle. I don't want to spoil it for everybody. I don't want to even paraphrase it. We've got you. We want to hear from the horse's mouth for everybody that's in a relationship, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, mom, dad, Dr. Emerson, can you explain real quick to everybody for the purpose of this, what is the crazy cycle? Well, the University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years, and they said, we now know the two key ingredients for successful relationships, love and respect. And I think most of us would say, you know, that kind of rings true. That's just common sense. Uh, but it also becomes very gender specific. And uh, men tend to lean toward the respect side because most men, you know, say to Harry, hey, Harry, does your wife love you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Does she like you? No, not today. Not today. No. <laughs> and so he tends to deflate or, you know, uh, react negatively when he feels disrespected. Uh, she tends to react negatively when she feels unloved because she knows she loves him, but often wonders if he loves her as much as she loves him. But this then gives birth to what you just referenced, the crazy cycle. What happens when a wife feels unloved? She tends to react in a way that appears disrespectful to us. That's not her intent, but that's how she comes across as a man. If people talk to us, other men talk to us the way our wife does, you know, we pick in a fight, right? I mean, it just seems very um, disrespectful. What happens when he feels disrespected? He tends to react in a way that feels unloving to her. He withdraws, shuts down. Uh, and 85% of those who withdraw on Stonewall is the male, according to that research. So he then appears very unloving to her because she can't imagine doing that during a conflicted moment. You move toward each other, you talk it through, you say, I'm sorry, seek forgiveness, whereas he's walking off. So she ends up feeling unloved, he feels disrespected, and each reacts in, in a negative way that feels even more unloving and disrespectful, and thus this thing spins. Without love, she reacts without respect, Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, and it gets crazy. 
And though she needs respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, and though he needs L-O-V-E, we've asked 7,000 people this question, Matt. When you're in a conflict with your spouse, do you feel unloved at that moment or disrespected? Get this, Matt, 83% of the men say they feel disrespected. Correct. 70, 72%, 72% of the women say they feel unloved. So there's still a percentage of people that would be an exception to what we're saying. So I always say, if the shoe fits, wear it. If not, don't worry about it. But the felt need most often during these marital conflicts or these intimate conflicts, what I call heated fellowship with Sarah, we've been married 49 years, 49 years, hard to believe. When we have that heated fellowship and get on the crazy cycle, that that tends to be how it plays itself out. That's nuts. Uh, By the way, how many of you tonight would look back in your relationships, would look back in your conversations and your arguments. How many of you have got yourself caught up in a crazy cycle? The funny thing, uh, Emerson, I, um, I always share with the people we are in business with how I got prospected and recruited into the insurance industry. And uh, I know you don't know this, but um, after serving in the Marine Corps, I, I, was, uh, I was a single father. I got married, I, got, uh, I became a father, got divorced, filed bankruptcy, all in the same year. It's part of the introduction here of uh, Faith Made Millionaire. Back then, I wanted to take pictures of my son, send it back to my grandmother, but instead of mailing the pictures, I went to go take that one of those Kodak develop, you know, those old wind up Kodak that you develop at Walgreens for an hour over express uh, developing. And uh, while I was developing, I went to Best Buy to buy a scanner because we had AOL 15 hours free (laughs) CD-ROM back then to get uh, an internet service dial up. And so while I was at Best Buy, I got prospected by a retired Marine that started a conversation. I, I asked all the time on stage, I said, hey, 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 gents, by the way, all the men that's on here, if there's a strange dude in the bathroom, do you strike up a conversation with a strange dude in the bathroom? And all the men always say, no, no way. You don't even make eye contact. <laughs> it's like, you keep, keep to your business. And then the flip side is, I asked the ladies, ladies, if you're in a bathroom and a strange woman's in there, do you find it okay within your heart to start a conversation with another woman? Are the ladies like, of course, of course. Dr. Emerson, do you find it funny that uh, God has wired us men and women so differently? Oh, I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, have you not read, he who made them from the beginning made them male and female. There's an XX, XY chromosome, and uh, he brings the sperm, she brings the egg. There are biological phenomena that then manifests itself in the everyday living. So a wife might say, I have nothing to wear, right? (laughs) What she means is she has nothing new. He says, I have nothing to wear. What he means is he has nothing clean. And I love that illustration because the sentence is the same. I have nothing to wear. I have nothing to wear. We say the very same thing, but we mean something totally different. And this is what makes relationships so interesting. We think we're communicating well, but there's a pink and blue perspective uh, that causes us to misunderstand each other. And one of my campaigns is to help people understand that often these conflicts are the result of honest misunderstanding. You know, when Sarah and I first were dating, I didn't say to Sarah, you know, you hate me and I hate you, so let's get married. It doesn't go down that way. So what happens over a period of time? How do we get derailed? How do these relationships get to a point where we're um, hurt by each other, we're frustrated, we're angry? I believe in those initial stages, there can be betrayal and adultery, and there can be some serious stuff. I'm not talking about that. But early on, we start having these conflicts because we don't understand the other person. And we think we do, and we're hoping they understand us. But we, we, and it's like when you're in a foreign country and you don't speak the language, what do you do when you're trying to get a message through to the person? You just start talking louder as though that's going to get through. And we do the same thing in marriage. We start talking louder to each other as though somehow they're going to hear us. But what makes it difficult is we don't think that we do speak a different language as men and women. We think that because we're equal, therefore we're the same. And we just assume that this should be clear. And because I know I'm normal and because I know I'm wrong, then I begin to conclude (laughs) my spouse has some serious issues. So I want to ask this for all the single bubs that's on this call. You're a single man. You're a single woman. Uh, down the road, they want to get married one day. I've always told everybody, especially, you know, the, what I've sh- shared in my book, I've spent my entire 30s repaying the mistakes of my 20s. When I got married, didn't know what the heck I was doing and got divorced, 
you know, you know when I got married, I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Well, winging it, it's probably not a good strategy and reason to get married. So for the purpose of the, the single folks that's on here, because a lot of our single folks that's on here are also running businesses. They're leading people that also are in marriages or that are in relationships. And sometimes they feel inadequate as a single person leading somebody that is married because they don't feel like they can identify with their issues as a married couple or people that are engaged or in a relationship. So my, my question to you is, if, if I'm a single person today, how would I go about, go, how would I go about my business focused on building my business, but at the same time too, one of these days I might want to find somebody I want to get married to too as well. So what advice and guidance would you give somebody that's single today? Well, I think you uh, addressed it, that there is a need for a, a little skill and a little knowledge. I mean, even you are advocating how to succeed in business and there are principles and those principles work. And if you work the principles, it has uh, successful results typically. And uh, we wouldn't go into a business with no knowledge, no skill. I mean, that just is laughable, right? And yet somehow in a relationship, when we get into one, it's very easy. It's just natural uh, because it doesn't take a lot of work. And we kind of think that's how relationships should be. And so now suddenly these conflicts start happening and we begin maybe to second guess that or whatever. So the, the question is, well, what knowledge and what skill do we need? Well, partly that's why I wrote Love and Respect to communicate to people, here are the skills, and you don't have to have a lot of them. You don't have to have a ton of knowledge, but here's some basic principles that if you work these, it will result in positive results, given the other person has basic goodwill. If they do, it just will uh, be a very beautiful thing. Now, a single man or woman uh, in a business, they know that with regard to their business. And most people are looking to be in a meaningful relationship. Few people would consider themselves celibate per se. And so the challenge again, it's not so much finding the right person as it is being the right person. One of the things I say when I speak to younger singles, you know, they're looking for the perfect person out there. And I say, well, if you found the perfect person, why would a perfect person be interested in you? <laughs> you know, but I think the challenge for us is to be the right kind of person. And what happens, people who are mature, who, who have the qualities we want, they'll sense the genuineness in us. Opposites uh, attract in that sense. And, but uh, also, that's because we sense that person's filling a gap that I have. And the people just recognize maturity. They recognize a quality person. So the challenge is for us to work on our personal skills. If I have areas of my life where I explode an outburst of anger or curse. I just, all the things that can quench another person's spirit, we have to say, am I really ready for this relationship? Um, and we want to believe that we are, but my challenge always is, let's kind of visit first things first. Am I the right kind of person that would attract that individual? Wow. So in today's day and age, uh, Emerson, you've been, you've been around the block many, many, many times. You've counseled and pastored many people in multiple generations, whether they're baby boomer, whether they're Gen X, a millennial, and now the Gen, Gen Z, what are some of the timeless values and principles that regardless of what generation you're in, you want to make sure that that person has these qualities? Well, that's the main message. It comes down to two key ingredients. I mean, and, and Sarah, my wife, when we do the conferences, the love and respect conferences, so it's, there's really two ingredients and you really only have to remember one. <laughs> and as I always say, if a man were to ask, a husband was to ask her in your relationship, is that which I'm about to say or do going to feel or sound loving to her? If you ask that question, and if you didn't know the answer, ask her, how, what would sound or feel loving to you? You're probably going to be 93% of the way there. <laughs> it, and it's a very simple thing. If we're willing to not justify ourselves and blame them. You know, we are unlovable or you just are overly sensitive. We go mm -hmm. into that kind of rant. But if that person's got goodwill and we ask ourselves, is this really going to sound loving to her? Because we kind of know, but yeah. we don't stop and ask that question. So too, for a woman, it's, it's a counterintuitive to say, is that which I'm about to say or do going to sound respectful to him? Because the culture says respect must be earned. If she doesn't feel he deserves it, he hasn't earned it. And uh, she's not going to respect bad behavior. There's a misconception of what we mean by respect. It's unconditional respect, just as it's unconditional love. In other words, it's a positive regard toward the spirit of that man, just as it's a positive regard toward the spirit of the woman. You respectfully confront that which is unlovable. You respectfully confront that which is not respectable. You don't respect that which is not respectable or, or lovable. 
So once people get that, they suddenly realize, then this is about who I am in relationship to this person who fails to be what I'm expecting them to be. That's right. And you need to address these issues. But as a woman, if you say, is that which I'm about to say going to sound respectful to him or not? And don't give yourself licenses. You can just kind of say anything you want. You're probably going to be 93% of the way. It just works. And I say to people, okay, don't believe me, but just try it for the next three weeks with the people that are in your world and just do this and watch what happens. Oftentimes, it's this appearance of hostility, the appearance of contempt, this negativity. So one thing Sarah and I say in our relationship, you can be right, but wrong at the top of your voice. And so what happens is that we don't understand the extent to which we sabotage things by our own demeanor. Wow. <laughs> okay. Woo! Oh, how, how about that one? Right, but wrong at the top of your voice. That, that was a profound one. Here's what I caught, caught myself, finding myself in, um, and I'm still working on the residual of this in, in my interaction with, with Sheena. And I would say something like, you know, babe, if, if you just said it this way, if you only came across this way, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like externally blaming her. If only you did this, I wouldn't mm -hmm. react like this. Mm -hmm. So I found that as I kept doing that, I wasn't winning the war there. How come? Well, I mean, obviously she feels attacked. She feels that she's responsible for your reactions and you're probably holding her responsible for her reactions. <laughs> and so a man of honor and justice realizes if that's how that's coming across to her, it would feel unfair to her. But I think there is a place to giving voice to our needs. That's appropriate or our vulnerabilities. But that's after the fact that we've asked the question of Sheena, how can I come across to you more lovingly when I'm upset? I know I'm not going to do this perfectly. I know I fail. Um, and one of the beautiful things with women, if you just apologize for having been unloving, the apology for being unloving, you don't have to be perfect just acknowledging those moments of imperfection. Most women are very forgiving. That's what they're looking for. They don't expect him to be perfect, but they would. They do expect him to acknowledge her feelings. But again, if we just say, how can I come across to you more lovingly? What can I do for you that's more loving? And we stay on that message for a while, then we'll have a right at those moments where maybe she's coming at us too strong to say, hey, I just got to tell you that that sounds really disrespectful to me. I'm vulnerable to that. I, if I was like the Lord and I was perfect and I could walk on water, I wouldn't be adversely affected by this. Can you help me here? So there is a place for that. But if, if it's always pointing the finger, if we're saying I am the way I am because of you, I mean, we have this principle. My response is my responsibility. My response is my responsibility. Sarah doesn't cause me to be the way I am. She reveals the way I am. Oh. Now, at first, that's very intimidating because I don't, I don't want, I, I want to justify myself and blame her. It's, it's easier. <laughs> I've said to Sarah, look, your response is your responsibility, Sarah. And my response is your responsibility, Sarah. And if you just take that position, I'll be happy. But of course, that's not, that's not going to work. So, but once I came to a point where I realized my response is my responsibility, Sarah doesn't cause me to be the way I am, she reveals the way I am, that actually proved to be very liberating to me because what I was doing was blaming Sarah for my behaviors. And so she was in control. And if you technically look at that, then she's, she's in control. And I said to myself, I, I don't want to submit to that idea that she's controlling me. It doesn't mean that I'm not affected. I'm not a robot. It's not mechanical. But at that deeper core where I might have an outburst or I would do something, I wanted to blame her. And I began to really think about this. And I thought, you know what? I'm free. I'm free. She can't get me to be unloving. That's my choice. And once right. I discovered that, it just liberated me because right. otherwise I was just this victim. I was a hopeless, helpless victim who had no say or control. And once I came to that point of owning up to my issues, it was amazing how Sarah softened in her spirit toward me. Wow. Wow. Before I ask you about faith and money, I want to ask you first about your book before you hit sent. So can you, can you preface this and, 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 and or summarize this for, for the person that signed it? Because it's pretty intriguing. Preventing headache and heartache. Yes. Well, HarperCollins asked me to write this book because the title, I think, captures it, Before You Hit Sin. In other words, <laughs> think before you speak. A lady said to me once, you know that little thing in the back of your brain that tells you not to say something before you say it? I said, yeah. She said, I don't have that little thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's kind of an excuse. But there is a uh, humor to that. And we all kind of find ourselves going, whoa, and we're trying to pull it back. And uh, it's already out there. 
World Wide Web means worldwide. Social media means social. There's no backspace button. And so what we have to do is think before we speak. And when I was younger, I learned to ask several questions that has guided my life. And my daughter, adult daughter, is the one that wanted me to write this book because she said, Dad, you tried to apply these all through the years. You've talked to us kids about it. We have three adult children. And uh, she said, you've got to do this. with." So HarperCollins and she kind of put their heads together. And so this is uh, really kind of one of my life messages. But there are four questions that I encourage everybody to ask before they write or speak. I love those questions. So can, can you can you break down those four questions? I'm, 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 I'm ready to go. <laughs> I, I forget what they are. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, w- I was wanting to know if you were listening. So I of stopped course. Right there. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm ready to rock. Well, and that's what you said earlier. I mean, it was a joy just, you know, 10 days ago, a week ago, Friday or something, I spoke at Liberty University, 9,000 students at the Convo on this very topic. And uh, the four questions are these, and we've done research on these. These are all four distinct concepts. In other words, they're not synonyms. They don't bleed in each other. It's like four legs to a chair. Remove one leg, what happens? You, you tip over. That's exactly yeah. right. You have to have all four in order for there to be stability. The four questions are these, and I unpack all of this in the book in depth. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And is it clear? This is not rocket science, but I have over the years realized, you know, man, this is not always easy to do when I'm angry, when people have provoked me, you know, uh, and so what we try to do is unpack, why should I speak what's true? Why should I be kind? Why should I speak what's necessary? Why should I be clear about this? Particularly now, man, as we're in this culture where there is this mindset that basically says, I can lie to you, but don't you lie to me. I can Mm -hmm. be uncivil to you, but don't you be uncivil to me. I can be very rude, but don't you be rude to me. I can say what's whatever I think is necessary, but you better not say anything that's unnecessary about me that's going to mislead uh, other people about me. And I can have insinuation. I can be unclear. I can be very misleading in my comments, but you better not do that toward me. And, and there really is this sense. It's almost what I call um, uh, almost a, a, a pathological mental illness. When a person is in that kind of situation where they can do anything they want, but other people can't do that toward them, this is a serious, serious problem. But most of us realize what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and that's the golden rule, and that if I expect this to be done for me, then I'm going to commit myself to do this toward other people. The question on the table is, for business people, is this going to lead to success, or is this complete idiocy? This, this is like, you know, you got two brains, one's lost and the other's out looking for it. So you're, you're empty headed here. But I don't believe that's the case. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, if you're going to persuade somebody about your product, that you start out with the five negatives and then go into the 17 strengths. I mean, there's a place for persuasion and emphasis, but there's also a place for candidness. And I think people who sell a good product usually are very honest about here's the downside. Here's the upside. But we just believe you're not going to find anything like this. We yeah. have money back guarantee and uh, no questions asked. I mean, there are <laughs> products and services out there that will blow you away at times because those individuals know that that's something they can stand by. So, again, I just believe that you don't have to compromise these things to make a buck. You just don't. And, in fact, I shared with the student body, Teddy Roosevelt, when he was a cowboy out West and um, he had just hired this cowboy to round up his own cattle and they were out wandering the the range and this cowboy saw all these unmarked cattle that were just strays and he says to Teddy hey I'll go steal those and put our brand on it because they're not branded and Teddy Roosevelt said you're fired I said what do you mean I'm fired he said you're fired if you will steal for me you will steal from me wow wow and the same thing, you know, if you hire somebody, it's like I said, the student body is if, if you, if a, if, a, if a company hires you and said, if we hire you, will you be honest? Your response to that should be, whether you hire me or not, I'll be honest. Your employment of me doesn't determine my moral compass. And so there comes a moment when we make a decision about this is who I am going to be. And there is a price to pay. And people say, you know, honesty doesn't always pay. That's right. But dishonesty eventually makes you pay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
last question because it is about money, is about relationships. I wanted to ask you this from a faith-based perspective and person that works not only in, in the world, in the marketplace, but also well with inside God's people. What's your perspective here? Because, you know, oftentimes right now, 70% of people right now, there's an article by CNBC that 70% of all Americans that because of rising interest rates, inflation, so 70% of all Americans right now need to make more money and they're looking for ways to make more money. And then what happens is in this process too, is like a lot of them, in, especially in the church, are praying for a financial miracle in the church on Sundays. But yet when opportunity comes their way and somebody's willing to help them to make more money, but they have to work. I mean, they just can't have it land on a lap, but they got to get to work and they hide behind God. They hide behind, well, I'm praying for it and waiting for a burning bush. I'm waiting for God to speak to me. I got to go home and talk to my wife. I, blah, blah, blah. I got to talk to my husband. And they don't make a decisive decision because they're caught up in religion, not necessarily moving forward because, you know, their, their faith asks them to. What, where do you stand here on this process, right, with we're out in our country, faith and money, and, and, and improving their, their finances? Well, I think you referenced the idea, and James hits it. If you don't work, you don't eat. Simple. It's very, it's very <laughs> simple. I mean, the, the Jewish community believed in industry. They believed in hard work. They believed the hand of the diligent makes rich, Proverbs says, you know, and there's this emphasis on slothfulness. But I, I often talk about a grid, you know, we tend to land, you know, the hand of the diligent makes rich. And, and there, there's truth of that. But we also know that there can be evil employers like James really rebukes the employers who actually was murdering some of their employees saying that their blood was crying out from the ground. So there was murder going on by these employers toward the employees. So you have some people who are very diligent, but they ended up being murdered, or you can be in poverty because of persecution. So those are two of the grids. Then you can have some very slothful people that are poor because they simply don't work. And you can have some people that you know don't work very hard at all, but they lie, they steal, and they get a lot of money. So we have to have a grid perspective and make sure we don't land in one of those as I say, there are righteous people who are rich and there are unrighteous people who are rich. There are unrighteous people who are poor around the world and there are uh, uh, righteous people who are unrighteous people who are rich, if I said that correctly. Um, and so you have that, if you take the righteous, unrighteous and rich and poor and you put it into a grid, we have to make sure that we rightly represent that because as you read scripture, you know, you, you'll see that. I mean, you, and, and you also understand in Proverbs that these are principles, not promises always. I mean, you'll, you, there's one verse that says, answer a fool according to his folly. The very next verse says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. And uh, Solomon wrote this to Jer uh, Rehoboam, his son. And Rehoboam, when he became king, was evil. He didn't listen to one thing his dad said to him. So we have to make sure that when we land on certain Proverbs or scriptures, that we make sure that we rightly interpret that. Because you'll see then in this case, yes, if you're righteous and you work hard, it can lead to wealth. And that's a basic commitment and it just makes sense. But we don't want to guilt trip someone who's suffering in China right now for the cause of Christ and is being persecuted in prison and they're in poverty and somehow maybe they did it wrong. We want to say to that brother, no, you're suffering for righteousness sake. Yeah. And just because someone is very, very wealthy doesn't necessarily mean that that's God's blessing. And someone, on the other hand, who is very wealthy from hard work, we can give all credit. Every good thing comes down. Every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. And that should then lead to a deep gratefulness. So I've always tried to approach as a pastor the, the grid to make sure that we don't become truncated and, uh, and really mislead people. And you see people today landing in one area. If a person's poor, it's because they've been mistreated. And there's truth to that. But as a pastor, if someone came to us poor, we would always say, we're going to give you money, but you got to work for it, or we'll go out and buy the groceries for you. Well, they would be out the door real quick if they weren't sincere. It just works that way. Wow. So you've got to make sure that you approach people correctly. There are some true poor, but there are other people in that state because of reasons that are not necessarily healthy or good. And we mustn't intimidate people who are trying to maybe help the poor work and give them jobs instead yep. of just giving them free handouts. And so we have to make sure that we do this prudently as a culture. And I'm disturbed by how we are not necessarily uh, fair in our assessment of people. Profound. That was profound. Thank you. 
All right, so Brenda, let's let's fire away with some questions. We we have until the top of the hour, uh, maybe a few minutes until after, after the top of the hour, we'll complete. I, I asked Dr. Emerson here uh, for for uh, sixty minutes of his time, and he's been very generous with it. So, Brenda, who we got? Awesome. So David Gomez asks, when you feel you have a good marriage, what areas can we focus on to make it a great marriage? Good yes. Question. No, I think if, if you've got that, uh, really a good marriage, my encouragement is to think about how to communicate why that is to other people who don't have one. Begin to think about people beyond your marriage. Go from your marriage to ministry so that maybe you have a small group, you bring people into it. And, you know, you can just share, you know, hey, we don't have all the answers, but uh, most people are going to come to you and say, you know, I, I wish we had you know, what you have, you're so lucky. And you need to be able to say, it's not luck. <laughs> Let me tell you why we are where we're at. And maybe you and your wife or your husband would like to get together with us and talk. So I challenge people to go from that very good marriage to a great marriage by serving other couples. Wow. And there here's the go. deal. If you can't tell people why you have the marriage you have, then they're just going to think it's due to luck. And you and I both know that's not the case. And a lot of times people have an envy toward people who have great relationships and, and they want that, but they don't want to go through the suffering that you went through to get to that. Yeah. Boom. And Bobby, David, I know you, you do that every day. You're, you are running your office here in Dallas. You're running your organization. You are helping and serving other couples. My brother, you are on the right path. Great question. Brenda, what's the next one? So your office coach, Dallas number one office asks, how do you deal with the act of feeling disrespected and maintain open communication? Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, I yeah, just got disrespected. No. Boom. So when you feel dis, is this a man or woman saying this? You know, who 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 asked a question, Brenda? It says Dallas number one office. So but no, maybe but no the name. whole office feeling this way. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think no first name. of all, first of all, we see just how painful how painful it is when we are disrespected. When we sense we're being disrespected for who we are as a person, when there's that look of contempt or disgust or the rolling of the eyes. I say to people, in fact, it's been said even in the research on marriage, that the lack of respect is more powerful than the lack of love at times. Two people who honor each other, respect each other, even though it's like assigned marriages around the world, India and other places, if they have a basic civility and respect toward each other, they, they didn't even know each other yesterday, so to speak. And so the love has to grow. But if there's that basic respect and civility, that relationship can move forward positively. So my point here, then when that disrespect is being shown in the work arena or whatever, this is extremely provocative. And so all of us have to anticipate, how am I going to respond when I'm treated in a way that's very demeaning to me as a human being? And uh, is tit for tat the way to go about this? This is a deeper issue because I don't know the details in that situation. But one challenge is we all need to be prepared for those moments. And, we, and this is why I said before you hit sin, there's a tendency to be an impulsive. You know, uh, that I, if somebody writes me an email, I want to just blast back. <laughs> so what I do is a 24 hour, you let it set for a while. I even wrote an email today and I let it set for a while because my proclivity is to just blast away. And I, I've got a pretty good command of language and I can just cause that person to whimper. And I've learned that sometimes people come across that way and they don't even know it. They're not intending that. They're upset about something else. They didn't, they didn't intend it. So we've got to make sure we decode and get at the facts. Not every feeling is the voice of God. <laughs> you know that this is not necessarily uh, truth. Just because I feel this way doesn't mean that person intended to be that way. So we have to take our time and make sure. But given they really are disrespecting us, in one sense, we need to feel sorry for them. They've got a problem because you don't treat other people that way. And this is sad. And, and in part, you need to have an empathy toward them. And they may be hurting over something else. Hurt people hurt, as we say. Ooh, hurt people hurt people. That's right. Awesome. Brenda, what's the next question? We're firing uh, away here. Shanitra, yeah, Shanitra Bradshaw asks, how do you best have a crucial conversation with someone that doesn't take accountability? Ooh, they don't take accountability. Yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming they're always placing the blame. You know, so you address the issue on the table and it's somebody else's fault. It's not their fault. They don't take a, accountability for this. That's what I'm assuming that question is. And uh, the first thing is usually a person like that is extremely insecure, uh, very fearful. Uh, sometimes that's the person you have to let go because they don't, they're not teachable. If they're insecure and fearful and they're trying to give you the right answer because they don't want you to disapprove of them, 
then they're hedging because they, they don't want you, they, they want to come up with some reason that might prove to be acceptable to you. But with right coaching, you can help them not be fearful of being teachable. And I'm bringing this up because I want the best version of you. I believe in you and I believe there's a place for you in this company. But you've got to be accountable for this because as I understand it, this is what you were asked to do. You didn't do it and you're kind of placing the blame. And I did my research. That person wasn't even around at the time. So let's talk about this because I want you to think about what's going to be best for you in this company. If at some point they continue to lie and place blame and justify self, you just have to say, you know, I don't believe the Lord wants you in this company because there's somebody out there that you can perhaps serve better than us. And I don't want to deprive them of having you. But uh, we need to pink slip you at this point and give you a little bit of a severance. <laughs> Yeah, but that's, that's one of the hardest things to, to ever come across. Somebody doesn't want to take accountability. And then why do you continue to pour into somebody that doesn't want to improve them, themselves? Yes. Like you, you can't help somebody that doesn't want to help themselves. And, you know, just please be active in your own rescue. And if they don't want to be, wow, you know, it's. Yes, yes, yes. No, exactly. Well said. Such an energy drain, you know? Yeah. Such and and, it, and it's, that's part of leadership because you don't know that sometimes going in. You see it in retrospect, but you try to figure that out as best you can as a leader yeah. so that you don't waste that time. But um, again, that's why uh, be slow to hire, quick to fire. Oh, all right, Brenda. What's what's uh, we're firing away here? We can. Oh, we yeah. can I love this. <laughs> this I love great. this. Like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Latanya Davis asked, "How can a husband and wife better communicate with each other when making decisions for business?" So I'm assuming they're in business together. So you have this joint, and I don't know what your authority structure is. I don't know the division of labor. So. It raises some questions, but if this is basically a partnership where we both have equal say and uh, we come to the table on that, it's uh, that's why I'm writing a, a, a series of books on what I call the win-win marriage. And how do we come to that moment where we have honest differences of opinion, not only in the business, but you're going to have a male-female perspective here as well, that the literature points out, Harvard studies have shown that women, for instance, are a little bit more risk-averse, men are a little bit less risk-averse. The, the implication of that. It can be uh, very disheartening, but if two people will come together, they can find a third option or what we call a creative alternative that that friction, iron sharpens iron. So one brother sharpens another actually can be to your advantage if you don't end up yelling and screaming at each other. I talk about the importance of having rules of engagement and how we're going to argue without claiming I'm going to divorce you or cursing, screaming. What happens in these moments of tension, we don't see that friction as beneficial. We see it as uh, de-energizing and we get mad and we start pointing fingers. And uh, that is a violation of everything here. One, this difference of opinion can lead to a better decision. So you need to see that two heads are better than one and then enter into this, what I call proposal, counterproposal until you can find a win-win solution that both of you say, that works for me. Yeah. But people don't wanna go through the process because it's chaotic. It, it, we get emotional. We feel as though they're telling us we're stupid. So you have to avoid certain kinds of things. But given that you can get this parameter, what I call the rules of engagement, you'll end up being the best decision makers and have the most effective company because uh, it's the best of both worlds. But few people are able to achieve that kind of hype between a husband and wife in business. But those who do, nobody can compete with it. When did you and Sarah figure out that you guys can be in business together? Well, we see ourselves as a ministry together, although I have a business mindset. I mean, I've said I, I've got a business mindset with a ministry heart. So we started Love and Respect. It's a 501c3. But I said, I want to provide a service and a product that funds the ministry rather than going out and getting donations. Let people give donations elsewhere. So I said, I'm going to live and die with that. And that's kind of how we proceeded. Sarah's very astute administratively. She's just got a great ability financially and so on and so forth. And we've kind of had a division of labor. Um, although I say to our people, our conferences, we decided I'd make all the major decisions and she would make all the minor decisions. And I share with people that's worked extremely well since 1973. We've not had a major decision yet. <laughs> yes. I remember when you said that, I appreciate your reminder. And, and do you have a difference in depth when you're talking, cause you speak to, you speak to Navy SEALs, you speak to the NFL, you speak to Congress. You speak to people with a lot of testosterone, a lot of estrogen. Is is there is there like a, a stable medium between what's the most effective, regardless of where you are on the hormone scale? I don't know if I fully understand the question. I love the question, but I don't know if I fully understand it. 
that may maybe come at it one more time. Yeah, I mean, is is there like a, a stark difference between talking to some some people are just like hardcore testosterone filled people and hardcore estrogen type people? Is is there somewhere in the middle there that works for both that that uh, you don't have to be so extreme? Oh, in your, absolutely. In your That's the, yeah. yeah. So you're tracking with the point I'm trying to make that there is this if you if you have a pink and blue perspective, you know, as Christ followers, we believe the Lord and have this faith perspective husband and wife, male and female, when you put pink and blue together, you get purple, the color of royalty, the color of God. Oh, wow. Pink and blue together finds that purple solution. And it's there. And Jesus Christ said, the two shall become one, right? But we end up arguing about which one. Ours. Yeah, ex exactly, man. Pink and blue is purple. Royalty. Yes. And that that's the, the goal. None yeah. of us achieve yeah. it perfectly. But if sometimes we think that when we have these, if we had a good relationship, we had this what I call the Hollywood view of marriage rather than the holy word view of marriage. And so people have this Hollywood that it should be 99% perfect and we should never have this tension, never have the friction, never have the conflict. Our three forms of government were created by our founding fathers to create friction because there's better decision making that way. And the Lord has put the two of us together and we know iron sharpens iron, so one brother sharpens another. So instead of getting upset about these troubling moments, we need to welcome them. They're not they're not fun. I don't, I don't like it when Sarah and I have heated fellowship, but we've been through this enough now that we realize that there's something good or better that's going to come out of that. We're going to find the, the, the best and the, and the better uh, as we move forward. And we also take the position that it's not a, a black and white issue. We say pink and blue have conflicts over gray area situations. We have arguments. Pink and blue have arguments about what I call the gray area issues. But we end up escalating into black and white issues when they're not black and white. It's not an immorality. It's not an illegality. But we make it that because if I know I'm right, then my spouse has to be wrong. <laughs> and so what we do is we tell them they're wrong. No, their decision may be less better. It's what we call a comparative statement, not a qualitative statement. Qualitatively, we're not saying you're wrong. No, we're saying comparatively, it's less better. We don't say it that way, but that's the truth. I think my way is better. I think your way is less better. But yours isn't bad. And so if we can begin to use language that allows that, then there's going to be a healthy debate about this without the other getting overly defensive. And because you're now telling them that they're wrong and this just takes us off track. Yeah. By the way, I put here heated fellowship. Is that your word for argument? Yes. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Heated fellowship, everybody. I love that word, that phraseology. Brenda, next question. Janice Killingsworth asks, what are healthy and unhealthy habits in your everyday relationships? Oh, by the way, this is big money right here. Janice made a lot of money. Janice Marks made a lot of money last month. So one more, one more time, Brenda. What are healthy and unhealthy habits in your everyday relationships? Well, I mean, you've got a number of, uh, you've got physical health issues, and uh, but I don't know if you're referring to the emotional, the inner dynamics. I mean, Obviously, those rules of engagement that I talk about, when you violate that, that's unhealthy in that sense. So if there are couples who tell me they're always threatening with D. You know, they get to a point of an argument where they'll threaten the other person, I'm going to divorce you. And they create a fear of abandonment and it ends up manipulating that person to conform to whatever it is that they're mm -hmm. requesting to happen. That's unhealthy. You, you don't, that's not the kind of thing we want to do. Or if your old man was a cussed and screamed and you now have brought into the marriage this kind of thing and you're you're cussing at your wife and you're, you're you're these are unhealthy things and the question on the table is why do we do that is this going to actually make us more effective we all, we all know it's not the best version of ourselves and we also know in an unemotional moment it's really probably not going to be proving effective so one of my concerns is that people get in tune what am I doing to sabotage relationships? What am I doing to discredit myself? What am I doing to, that's undermining my reputation with my own children, particularly as I treat their mother or their father in these unhealthy ways? But I don't know the frame of reference there, but I would say this, there are healthy ways of doing relationships and there are unhealthy ways of doing relationships. Wow. Great question. Great answer. Brenda. It's kind of a segue one? into the next one. Um, Bokar Diaby asks, with People who don't grow up in traditional two-parent households with a healthy marriage, what challenges have you seen they have and what do you typically re recommend for them to do to be able to have and maintain healthy relationships marriages? 
Well, that's Sarah's story and my story. I'm call, I, I spoke to the student body again at Liberty University about the wounded healer. My mom and dad divorced when I was one, then they remarried, but then they separated for five years. We weren't Christ followers. My dad had rage issues. There were so many problems that mom, who had a good business mind and was very successful, sent me to a military school in eighth grade. And I was there until I graduated from high school. And I found Christ at the military academy and then went to Wheaton where Billy Graham had gone. I was planning on West Point. So the, the woundedness in me is very deep. Sarah and her extended family, there are 18 divorces and uh, everybody almost was divorced. And so tremendous pain. And so one of the points we make is we came to a point where we realized we knew what was wrong because we saw it. So just with a little thought, hey, I wonder if the opposite of that <laughs> would work. This is why people who feel like they're damaged goods that there's no hope for them, that you know they come out of this upbringing and family of origin that is just permanently damaged. And I said, no, 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 no. You actually are very close to having great wisdom on how to do relationships because you know what doesn't work. But someone like me has to say that to you because we will all have moments. Sarah and I still, you know, we, we are affected by our upbringing, but we don't let our defeat defeat us. We just, there's a Proverbs, Proverbs 26, 614, it says a righteous man falls seven times, mm. but rises again, but rises again. So we just, Sarah and I just get back up and we revisit. We know, well, that doesn't work. That's not, that doesn't work. And so we, we want to do it well, but you've got to have a desire to do that. Some of us just, we don't care. I, I don't care. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, if you come to a point where you don't care, then you have to step back and in, in terms of this faith component, I mean, this is ultimately about you pleasing Christ and pleasing the Lord and doing what he wants. And if we have an attitude, I don't care, uh, particularly I talk to husbands, husbands live with you, First Peter 3, 7, live with your wives in an understanding way. And, and, and then he goes on to say, honor her as a fellow of the grace of life. And then he says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And the prayers there are the husband. And I say to the men, um, how are you how's your prayer life? And the guy said, it's, it's, it's just not what I want it to be. And I said, well, how are you treating your wife? You know, did you say wife or prayer life? I said, no, how are you treating your wife? He said, what's that got to do with the question you ask about prayer? He said, the direct correlation. If you choose to say, nobody can understand you, woman, and there's a dismissive attitude and really putting her down, you're the Christ figure as a husband. So the Lord, who is the Christ, is saying to you, if you're not going to listen to her and understand her, I'm not going to listen wow. to you and understand you. And there's an incentive then from a prayer standpoint. So one of the things we have to do is step back and say on a horizontal level, maybe we were discouraged, whatever, but we've got to guard against going too far in this because we have another relationship that we have to maintain given that we're true believers. There, there's just such raw responsibility and ownership of stepping up as a man, as I hear you just continue to just rip. If you're a man of honor, that's exactly right. A man of honor. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Pat Riley had me come speak to the Miami Heat and Coach Spo and spoke to the team. And he actually at that time said, you're the first person I've had speak to the team. But he and I spent about five hours talking about issues of honor. And uh, I was in the presence of this icon. I mean, this guy knows everything. And partly he was just absorbing everything he could get here. And I just was so honored. But we talk about the, the honorable man and, and being an honorable man. And what does that look like? And uh, my challenge for those men out there is you have it in you. It's not fair to you. We're not talking about mere treatment, let's say, about your wife or some people in business that are treating you fairly. But you've got to get above that. Be the honorable man, because over time, you will influence people and uh, they just will follow you. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. We, we you have... cannot uh, let down in a way that you have contempt and hate and all these things that are disgusting when people talk about you, you don't want that. You want to be the person who's consistent and over a period of time. And I, I, I've said to young guys in the ministry or whatever, but I said, the key is to see the long picture. You, you got to see the big picture and then you just plod. You just stay with it. Just stay with it. Don't be, you know, thinking, oh, this is, I got, I got to do it right now. I, I chose at age 25 not to write a book until I was 50. I waited 25 years. Why? Because I saw so many people flaming out. You reach success too early, you're dead meat. You, you think that you're not going to be. There's a schemer that's coming after you. So every person has to know themselves, understand their Achilles tendon. In my case, I just thought, Jesus Christ doesn't need me. I'm not necessary. 
And so I'm just going to plod. There were many times when I felt like I was being overlooked. I felt there was a lid. And then came that moment when he illumined my heart with love and respect. And uh, (laughs) in three months, 100,000 hardback sold. It just exploded and it went out like a meteor. If you ask me, I'm saying that was the Lord's kindness to me, not because of any ability on my part. It's kind of like he looked down, well, 25 years is quite a bit. I'll, I'll kind of give here, you a crumb here. Wow. Well, that's freaking awesome. Um, the next question. Let's, let's keep firing away with these questions. Just, um, so Hevo CEO Greg Brown asks, what would you say to the singles looking for that someone that complements their vision? Well, I think that's very important. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, 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 that, that could be stated egotistically. But Sarah and I were just talking about this when we were back at Wheaton. And I said, you know, I was looking for a wife that wanted really to, to believe in me and, um, you know, that she was going to join the team and that together we would change the world for Christ and that that was important to her and that she believed in me. And I can remember even being asked early on, what are you looking for in a woman? I said, well, you know, I, I want someone to believe in me. And um, so I think if what you mean by that is that important. I mean, if you're, if, if, you know, two people, if they don't agree, cannot walk together, they, the prophet talks about. So, you know, if you, if you have two different visions, this is why if a believer marries an unbeliever, it doesn't mean the unbeliever isn't a better person on a horizontal level. It could be 10 times better than we are because yeah. we're coming out of a lot of stuff and they were raised in a wonderful home. But you're not going to have the same vision. You, you're just yeah. not going to have it. And then you come to that point where you have children. Or you are not going to talk about faith to your children. And there comes a moment when if you're not on the same page, it's going to lead to some tremendous uh, heartache. So my first response to that is it's crucial to find that person who believes what you believe and also, and it's not a selfish thing, believes in you. I, I did this uh, with, with my YouTube channel and social media. I get trolled all the time. I get uh, negative comments all the time. One thing that makes my day a whole lot better is my wife says, babe, I believe in you. I can't tell you how awesome that makes me feel. And the moment I'm off is when I feel like my wife doesn't believe in me. I just can't. Yeah, you, what a profound reality there. Thank you. Uh, next question, Brenda. Uh, Jay Pierre asks, how do you prepare yourself as a husband before you actually become a husband? Right, right. Exactly. Well, that's why the Love and Respect book, and I'm not trying to tout this book, but I, I gave a lot of time thinking about that. I talk about how you spell love to a woman. I put it in an acronym called COUPLE, C-O-U-P-L-E. She wants to be close. She wants you to be open with her. She wants you to understand her. She wants you to be at peace with her. She wants you to be loyal to her. And she wants you to esteem her. Is it Jacob you said? Is Jake or Jake? Jay Pierre. He's from Austin, Texas. Okay. If you get that, if you get, we we did, we had 4,200 at uh, Second Baptist at Houston with Dr. Young there, 4,200 and about 1,000 that attended were singles. And we said, this is God's game plan. And people said, why haven't you written a book on premarital? And I said, well, I was going to, but there are only a couple of verses that deal with premarital. And then I thought, Lord, why have you not addressed more about the premarriage? And the Lord spoke to me in that inaudible way, not audibly. This is my game plan for marriage. And I want the single person to understand the game plan. If you get the game plan, you're going to succeed. Um, And so um, it's important that uh, we as singles understand the game plan. And I said earlier, it, there is a challenge for us to be the right person. So there are areas of our life where if there's not a maturity there, have a, an honorable man speak into it. Someone who has suffered, I usually turn to people who have suffered because they're empathetic and say, you know, I think I've got some character flaws. I need to shore those up. Can you speak into this for me? So work on yourself. But then what is it that a woman needs from a man? And are you in a position where you can provide that, particularly at those moments where maybe she's not responding to your need in the way that you expect? If you get that, you're going to succeed in a relationship. There are very few women that would say, I don't want a man like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and by the way, Dr. Emerson, I was, I was a single father for 12, 13, 14 years. And, and all I did was just date my kids. I did in my business. And I wanted to make sure that the financial struggle of my life I think I may have Rudy Ortiz here. Rudy actually led me to strengthening my relationship with Christ because I, I remember being invited to a men's breakfast on a Saturday morning. I'm like, what are you talking about Saturday morning? I'm freaking hung over on a Saturday morning. But uh, it was him unpacking the Bible, making the Bible sound exciting and alive. I'm like, where are you reading from? Is that the Bible? And he, the way he just explained it, I never heard the Bible just being explained, articulated the way he articulated it. And um, 
I wanted to surround myself around him and other married people when I was single because I wanted to see what guys were doing right when they were married. And I was a single dad of three kids and I screwed it up twice. And so I was dating my life. I wanted to make sure I was a provider. So one last question, Brenda, for Dr. Emerson. And I just so appreciate this time so far. Yeah, of course. So um, ah, let me see. I had it pulled up. So this one right here, it comes from Joseph and Micah Leonard. And they ask, what are steps you can take to stop being so defensive when your spouse is giving you constructive feedback? Oh, yes. Well, if you figure that one out, let me know. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I, that's exactly the point, though. Oftentimes we think that a wife, and particularly as if it's the female, 85%, 80%, usually it's the woman who criticizes, complains, and the man withdraws and stonewalls at a certain point. He says, drop it when she's one and move toward to connect and, and, and clarify things because women have this undercurrent of insecurity that she's three conversations away from you saying, I'm done with you, I'm leaving you. There's this uh, fluid underneath there that she, this very disruptive. So she wants reassurance. She's gonna move toward you to get that reassurance. But that's why when she's coming, she sees herself as trying to help you often. But we see it as another opportunity that she's taking advantage of to point out to her, to point out to us that she finds us unacceptable. So we have a tendency to get defensive because we think she's really saying something about our character flaw. And so uh, if we can come to a point where we realize she's trying to be helpful and that she may even be bringing this up because she's wanting our strength, you know, she needs our love and we're the only one that can meet a need that she has. And so she's coming across negatively, but she thinks we're strong and we should be able to take it because it's really a compliment, not a complaint in that regard. But I think again, if you know that this is constructive criticism, then uh, why wouldn't we receive it? At the same time, if it's nothing but constructive criticism, then that wears us out because there has to be affirmation as well. And that would be something that two of you need to talk about. How can we kind of uh, be both positive as well as maybe constructive in our criticism? Because I'm feeling de-energized a little bit. I wish I was more teachable. Can you help me kind of receive some of this? But am I doing anything right? Can you also kind of let me know <laughs> that I've, I've made some headway? That's profound. Guys, I, um, listen, I, uh, I appreciate this, this moment, this time, uh, you've been profound when we brought you on our stage a couple of years ago and, and you just hit it out the park again, before we let you go, uh, any final thoughts about, you know, becoming better as, as a couple with regards of the, the situation we find ourselves now in the country post COVID, uh, you know, uh, now that we're going back into the workforce again, the, the environment that we're in as a country, any words of encouragement for us all as we venture out in strengthening our, our marriages, strengthening our businesses and, and strengthening our families? Well, I think what strikes me here uniquely is you've obviously got a great community and uh, this um, sense of community you have, you're there for each other. If I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, <laughs> and I think just this uh, the beauty of this, I mean, the encouragement that you're giving people, they call you the coach. And so I think just uh, appreciating the uniqueness of what you have here and uh, continuing to grow and learn, um, make sure, Paul says, you measure yourselves by yourselves and you compare yourselves with yourselves and you understand nothing. And it's very important that you not let somebody else's success create depression in you. This is where we've got to rejoice with those who are succeeding, learn from their strengths, but one of the things that will lead us away is jealousy and envy and making sure that we, I, I remember when I was pastoring, we had a very uh, dynamic church in a college town, Michigan State University, 45,000 students, East Lansing, Michigan, but we weren't running 15,000 people. And, and, and I realized something very quickly, the publishers will go after those pastors because they can turn over 10,000 copies and make their money back. And the key to having 15,000 people is being in a population with high density. So LA, Chicago, New York, if you look at the people who lead much of the publishing industry as pastors had huge churches in large cities. So what about a guy in, in a city of 15,000 and 4,000 of the people are coming? He's reached his whole community. Who's more pleased with that person? I mean, Christ is very pleased. So we have to step back and remind ourselves uh, Paul himself was this famous man, but there was a period where he was a reject, and he made this statement of the Corinthians. He was unknown, but known. Unknown, but known by the Lord. And in your diligence to succeed and, and to bring in finances, one of the struggles you're going to have is comparison. And you have to rejoice with those people, 
but just you stay on course. You keep doing what the Lord's asking you to do. Don't, don't sacrifice your priorities. There's a balance. There are seasons. And it's important. I mean, it's just important to maintain that. Okay. That would be the thought that's coming to me, Matt. That's that's awesome. Uh, guys, if you're on this Zoom right now, I've uh, un, I've allowed you guys to, um, I'm going to let you unmute yourself here in, in about 10 seconds, but could you please give a round of applause and make some noise for Dr. Emerson Agrich, pastor, entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, make some noise. We'll circle back again, uh, Dr. Emerson Agrich. I appreciate your time. Make some noise for Dr. Emerson Agrich. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, thank you, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Do they know that I saw them? Thank you. Yes, <laughs> seeing you. It's, it's, great. Oh, thank that's you. great. Thank you. Thank what you. a joy. Thank 100%. you. Thank you. All right, so for the rest of you guys, entrepreneurs, I know we have close out on our mind. I'm, uh, I appreciate you guys investing a little bit about your evening tonight to learn how to become a better person, be, become a better husband, a wife, a soon-to-be spouse. I appreciate you wanting to invest in yourself to become a better person overall. So that being said, guys, I'll let you get back to your close out. Let you get back to your Thursday. Please go back. Uh, uh, if you haven't done so, please purchase Dr. Emerson Eggerich's book. Before you hit send, and if you haven't done so already, please go visit uh, Love It and Respect. Uh, Dr. Emerson, what's your website? Love and Respect is it Love, love and Respect dot com. L o b e a n d r e s p e c t dot com. <laughs> that being said, guys, put your put your biggest takeaways here in the MSM three point group. Me, if you're part of uh. MSM PHP, but I appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. If you're watching this on YouTube because it is recorded for YouTube, please put your thoughts, your questions, your concerns, your your feedback. You agree with us? You don't agree with us? Please put it in the comment section below. With that being said, I think we might be doing this every month, and I just want to say thank you again for helping. Faith Man Miller become an Amazon bestseller in not only three categories, but also number one in multiple categories. Thank you for supporting the work of the Faith Man Miller. So therefore, Seven Figure Squad, a channel dedicated to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can become a first generation cash flow millionaire. That being said, from Dallas, Texas, on behalf of Dr. Emerson Egrich, I'm your mighty smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to smart. Continue to smart. Everybody smart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.